thank you everyone for coming this evening, or afternoon, I guess, whatever. Um, my name is Thomas Clark, I'm the president of the Anscombe Society. Before introducing our speaker, I just want to thank our really generous sponsors, the Love and Fidelity Network, Christian Union, um, USG Projects Board, and the Program in American Studies. So thank you for making this possible. All right, a recent issue in the Princeton Alumni Weekly asked the question, is dating dead at Princeton? Princeton has seen an interesting evolution from an all-male university to one with a 19 to 1 gender ratio uh, to a more even gender ratio today. But has this more even ratio translated to healthier relationships? I'm not so sure. I think many would agree that something is wrong. Someone, one, one student interviewed in the Paul article said, people used to date, now people are so afraid of commitment. Apps like Tinder and Frenzy, as well as alcohol, make it easy to have temporary gratification without committing. But for those who want to pursue a serious relationship, for those who think that perhaps just maybe dating in college could be the first step towards, heaven forbid, marriage, <laughs> um, there are precious few resources to help you with this. Is it that people are ashamed to admit they'd like to date? Or that we, being Princetonians after all, are afraid to admit we need help with something? Well, there's nothing wrong with dating, and there's nothing wrong with asking for some advice. On that note, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Van Epp, the president and founder of Love Thinks, and the author of How to Avoid Falling in Love with a Jerk. He has spoken all over the country and the world on the topics of marriage, family, recovery, being single, relationships, and divorce. He holds a PhD in counseling and psychology from the University of Akron, and has 25 years of clinical experience and extensive research in premarital, marital, and family relationships. Dr. Bennett has worked with many couples in their premarital relationships, and he and his innovative relationship attachment model that you're going to hear about today um, were awarded the Smart Marriage Impact Award in 2008 and have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, Psychology Today, and elsewhere. He has been happily married for over 34 years. His wife, um, Shirley, is with us today, and is a proud father of two daughters. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Van All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to kind of uh, start right where Thomas uh, introduced the topic. Uh, there was an article that was written on January 11th, 2013 in the New York Times, and it was titled, The End of Courtship. It was written by Alex Williams, and I just wanted to begin kind of our talk today focusing in on some of the topics that were brought up at the beginning of his article. His article begins with these several paragraphs. Maybe it was because they had met on OK Cupid, but when the dark-eyed musician with artfully disheveled hair asked Shani Silver, a social media blog manager in Philadelphia, out on a date, Friday night, she was expecting at least a drink or something one-on-one. -on -one. But at 10 p.m., she says, of Miss Silver, age 30, I hadn't heard from him. Finally, at 10.30, he sent me a text. Hey, I'm at the pub and kitchen. You want to meet up for a drink or something? I'm, with, uh, I'm here with a bunch of friends from college. <laughs> Turned off, I don't know why. She fired back a text message, politely declining. But in retrospect, she might have adjusted her expectations, Ms. Silver explained. The word date should almost be stricken from the dictionary. Our dating culture has really evolved to a cycle of text messages, each one requiring the code-breaking skills of a Cold War spy to interpret. The new date is just hanging out, she concludes. It's about one step above a high five. <laughs> Mr. Williams goes on and says, dinner at a romantic bistro? Forget it. William and the, uh, women in their 20s these days are lucky to get a last minute text just to tag along. Raised in an age of so-called hookup culture, millennials who are reaching an age where they're starting to think about settling down are subverting the rules of courtship. Instead of dinner and a movie, which seems as obsolete as a rotary phone, they rendezvous over phone texts, Facebook posts, instant messages, and other non-dates that are leaving a generation confused about how to land a boyfriend or girlfriend. You know, that article, it was interesting, it, it created such a buzz 
it went up to the number one news article of the day in like MSN and uh, uh, Google News and other news sites uh, on, online. But when you talk about confusion, I think that that confusion has bred on university settings things like what Duke University is doing. So if you're not familiar, Duke University, like some other universities, now have how to fall in love programs. So I, let me just read a little bit from Duke University. Uh, our How to, Love, How to Fall in Love series addresses the common issues and questions facing students involved or interested in romantic relationships. Session one explores the necessary ingredients of moving toward the experience of being in love, including recognizing when this is happening. <laughs> Session two explores some of the common stages of romantic relationships focusing on those that our experience is healthy and enriching. Session three introduces the common pitfalls that often doom relationships, as well as students helping students recognize when they may be in relationships that are toxic. So I, I see the value of that, actually. You know, I had a counseling practice, as Thomas mentioned, in Ohio for about 25 years. And in that time, I worked with a lot of individuals, a lot of couples waging their way through sometimes very toxic relationships. And it just struck me literally about 20 years ago that singles need to have some kind of a, of a map, as it were, some kind of a, a road map that helps them to direct through the, the navigating of, of relationships, particularly romantic relationships. And um, so I began to put together uh, what got published about 10 years after that, which was in 2005, um, How to Avoid uh, Falling in Love with a Jerk. And originally it was called How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk. And I found singles were scared of the word marriage, so you know they wouldn't read the book. So we changed it to falling in love. But actually, it's all about how to build a relationship. And I, I started to focus in on something that I found very few people would focus in on. Helping an individual know how to choose a partner, what to look for, how to figure out what that person would be like, what actually predicts what a person would be like years down the road in a long-term relationship, ultimately in marriage. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about that, um, that book, but actually back in 96 when I wrote the manuscript, probably honestly I was a little insecure about whether it was going to work for people. I saw it working, I thought, with people that I worked with in my counseling practice, but I turned it into a program. So I, I wrote an instructor course and wrote workbooks and all kinds of things. So um, we wrote these workbooks and started uh, just going around to conferences at the end of the 90s, uh, producing, um, you know, hey, we've got this program, does anybody want to teach it? Well, at first it you know, went off slowly, but right around the year 2000, it just caught fire. And um, all of a sudden we had all these people becoming instructors. Uh, and at this time, we have over 10,000 instructors. Uh, close to a million people have been taught in the programs that we have um, in the military, in uh, civilian settings, like uh, in single organizations and uh, nonprofits around the country, in high school settings, which is very, very cool to have high school kids going through eight hours about how to avoid falling for a jerk or a jerkette, and, um, and in university settings. One of the most exciting things is uh, professors teaching the course for credit to students to get certified so that not only in their own college life, but in their profession, they now have a course, a tool, kind of in their tool belt that they can go out, they can help facilitate, they get practicum credit in these universities to actually push the course out and teach it in different practical settings. So it's been very exciting to kind of see this develop. So what we're going to be talking about today is um, just a couple points of what to look for to, to figure out what a person is going to be like in a long-term relationship. And then also this model right here that has to do with your head and your heart working together. So um, we're going to start with the title, which is just kind of a way of introduction. So uh, I found this far side. You guys remember the far side from Gary Larson and... Uh, you know, he wrote these uh, quirky uh, cartoons, and he imagines God populating the world and saying, you know, well, let's grab a jar of jerks and make it kind of interesting. So he, um, he does that. Are there jerks in the world? Yeah. Okay, so if I ask you questions, 
Um, they're not rhetorical. So we'll practice for a minute. Everybody nod on three. One, two, three. And everybody do a little grunt language. And everybody say, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you cut it down. That's about all you need to do. That's, that's enough. <laughs> but um, we'll have a time of question and answer toward the end. Um, I'll go for about an hour 15, and then we'll pick up and take some questions and answers. But I want to um, cover, first of all, the reality that um, there are jerks in the world, but they're not just male. I know that we kind of think of a male when you think of the word jerk, right? But the reality is, is that um, jerks come in both genders. I know we have some wonderful females in the room, but have you ever, let me just ask you, not the guys, have you ever known another woman that was difficult to get along with? Anybody know another woman difficult to get along with? No, please don't point at <laughs> talking about you, sister. You know, don't do that, okay? <laughs> but if you've known another woman that's been difficult, and you, and you do your best, and you know, you kind of give it your best shot, and you put up with it, but after a while, you just conclude inside and say, you know what? I just got to face the reality that she is just one royal jerkette. And that's, um, that's what we're going to call the politically correct term, okay? I know there's a lot of words for this, but we're going to talk about people that are difficult to get along with. And I think the reality is, this is unfortunate, but it's actually getting harder on college campuses. There's a, a meta-study, so I'll cite some research as we go through the, the afternoon here and the, this presentation. There's an interesting meta-study on narcissism. By meta-study, what they looked at is all the studies that had been done on narcissism that had used the specific inventories to assess whether people in their early 20s, late teens, early 20s, had um, characteristics of narcissism and uh, characteristics of empathy. What they found over 30 years is this trend that narcissism has been increasing in college students and empathy has actually been decreasing, which is really interesting to me because other studies have shown tolerance in college students is increasing, but empathy is decreasing. So if you think about it, we tolerate people's differences, but we really don't have any empathy for them. It's kind of like a mindless tolerance. You know, hey, man, you can do whatever you want to do. I, I, not my business. But... Uh, don't ask me to get into your shoes and really have genuine care and empathy. And narcissism, on the other hand, is increasing. So I think in your lifetime right now, it's actually more difficult to find somebody who has their act together, who seems to have a maturity and a quality about them. It's a lot more difficult now than it was even 30 years ago, which seems crazy in my mind. But is that kind of a little bit of your experience? That there's a lot of people that just seem to be absorbed in self? So you're all like, no, is he talking to me? I was just thinking about what I had to do today. So um, what I think, though, is that the, the reality is that there's difficult partners in the world, and people to get into relationships with can be tough. So help me out here. We're going to just jot down some characteristics. We'll call it characteristics of difficult partners, OK? So help me brainstorm with this. You're going to shout it out. I'll try to keep up with you. What's one characteristic of somebody that would be very difficult to be with in a relationship? Yeah. Verbally abusive. Verbally abusive. <laughs> We're just going to go right to violence and abuse. All right? Let's just call it abusive in any kind of way. All right? You can shout it out. They don't listen. Selfish. And I listened to... People who don't listen. Go ahead, what else? Who's always looking at their phone? <laughs> phone aholics. I can actually see who's looking at their phone from up here. What's another character? Somebody, some characters are somebody that's difficult to be with in a relationship. What else? Unreliable, and then somebody else said something I missed it. Extremely strong will. Rude. <laughs> you know, I like the ones that are like extremely over the top strong will. Not like me, but really, really strong will. A lot worse than me. So I'm just going to put strong will plus. <laughs> what else? Characteristics of, of people that are really tough to get along with in a relationship. Passive aggressive. Inconsiderate. 
about dishonesty. All right, I'm kind of running out of room. Anything else? Yeah. Alright. <laughs> Spend too much money. Something in the back of their hand, if I think. Judgmental. Judgmental. Impatient. I'm running out of room, but you all have a lot of experience in this obviously. <laughs> Closed off. One more. Critical. Okay. Overly critical. Not a little bit critical. That's okay. All right. I ran out. Did we did we conclude all of the characteristics of difficult partners, or did we just kind of tap the surface of it? What do you think? So we're scratching the surface. So I just want to ask you guys a question. You know, seeing that you're here at Princeton and. Um, but how many of you, at one time or another, in a relationship, have been overly selfish? Raise your hand. Okay, so some of you. And um, how about Rude? Raise your hand. Oh, so it's the same people. <laughs> yeah. And I know those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're the dishonest people. <laughs> I know what's going on. So I got, a, I got a critical question for all of you. If we've all at one time or another acted like a jerk, which we all have, right? This is where you nod your head. All right. I'm not going to nod my head. Nod your head. If we've all acted like a jerk at one time or another, what's the difference between acting like a jerk and being a jerk? Consistency. Consistency. All right. Consistency. What else would you say? Let's, let's just kind of add these things up. Intentionality. Is that what you said? Yeah, so you got to be intentional about it. You got to be consistent. <coughs> Dedicated. Dedicated. <laughs> you know, you need, you need a life purpose. Jerk dumb is it. So, what would be another? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whether it's, it's something that you see as, as offensive and harmful to other people. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like an insight? Like if they, if they recognize they're doing it, they recognize they're doing it, they're trying to improve versus they don't recognize it or refuse to recognize it. And, and man, it's not just a recognition. It's what, that, that little thing that you said, trying to what? Trying to improve. Trying to improve. Because can't you, can't you just see this guy, male or female, right? Acts like a jerk. And then you're like, I'm done, you know? We've been over this and over this. Uh, we just need to take a break. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. Okay. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, okay, we'll give it a little bit longer. Okay, I'm so happy. That you... And then two weeks later, what is the person doing? <laughs> Same thing. So you're like, you know, I really can't put up with this. <clears throat> if somebody apologizes, but then keeps doing it, does that mean they're acting like a jerk or being a jerk? Being a jerk, because the key is whether a person is really genuinely working toward what? Changing that which harms another person. It's the genuine change that really characterizes somebody that has just had a slip up. The persistent resistance to change is what really urges, if you think about it, it's not any one of these characteristics. It's that this characteristic becomes persistently resistant to any kind of change. And that's what really gets people to be like, oh man, this person is such a, mm, such a jerk, because they don't make any kind of change. So at the very onset, before we kind of get into anything of, of you know, might say substance, just know that a key quality you want to see in a person that you're you know, interested in and going out with is whether they have kind of a, a soft heart, you might say, a sensitivity, a willingness to work on whatever gets put on the table that bothers you. You know, this is something that bothers you, me. And they're willing to work it through. And if two people have that, I'm telling you, my wife and I have been married actually longer than 34 years. It's 36 years. So, and we've known each other for 38 years. We dated when we were actually just in preschool. So that's when we got arranged married. So got married in junior high. So we're actually very young, but we've been together a long time. So not really, 
But the, the reality is, one of the best qualities, if we look back over this time of our marriage, one of the best qualities that helps to keep you close is that openness to trying to make changes in your own life in ways that, that meet the needs and are valuable and important to the person that you love. That sensitivity. And you can, you can identify this as you date somebody. I, I'm going to say everything that we're going to go over uh, and pretty much in my program and in my book all boils down to the head and the heart working together. So I know this is like really juvenile, but I'm going to have you do it. I want you to say, my head and my heart should work together. And I would just say, if you know anybody, how many of you have ever seen somebody that's been in a relationship with a problem person that's not changing? And other people can see it. Maybe you've even tried to talk them, you know, through the relationship, or you're their sounding board. They always come to you, and you're like, yeah, you're calling, you know, oh, they're, they're texting me, or they're calling me again. I know it's up. But they just don't see the issues, or they don't deal with the issues, right? How many of you have ever seen somebody in a relationship like that? Raise your hand. Just look around for a minute. Over half of the hands. We've all seen people like this. And if you analyze what's going on in their life, you can boil it down to their head and their heart somehow are not working in congruence. They're not working in harmony. They seem to have thinking going one way and heart going another, and there's this battle inside. So I just want you to say, my head and my heart should work together. Okay, everybody try to do that once. Ready? My head, my head and my, and my heart, heart should work, work together. together. And I'm going to start by explaining this model that really captures how the head and heart work together. So, um, in this model, this is a theoretical model of relationships that I developed in the, in the mid-80s when I was working on my PhD. So, let me just explain the theory behind this. Relationships, by definition, are what? A relationship is what? We just want to put out a word or two. What would you say? What's a relationship? So, interpersonal. Something... Between two people. So what is it between two people? It's a... It's mutual. It's mutual. It's a connection. And it's interesting. I, I don't know if anybody ever asked you to try to define the word relationship. But you have to define it very broad. It's a connection between two people. What I found, I was steeped in the 80s in uh, my studies and an area of my interest in what is called close relationships. Uh, attachment theory, which looks at uh, close relationships, particularly going all the way back to um, uh, infant caregiver relationships. But I was also interested in adult close relationships and theories on love. And what I found what was really lacking is all of these abstract concepts had not been put together in a more comprehensive picture of the specific connection. A relationship is some kind of a connection between two people, an interpersonal connection. But there was a ton of research on how people know each other and intimacy and um, there's theories of this and there were books written about it and like I said, literally thousands of articles in almost every category up here on trust and um, on reciprocity and meeting each other's needs and how you can form dependence and what codependence is and healthy and unhealthy dependencies and there's theories about commitment, commitment theories, and on and on. But what I found, and then touch, everything from how touch occurs between uh, uh, inf um, infant and a mother, and how that produces a bond in parents and children, all the way up to uh, sexual activity and how that produces chemicals in the brain. There's all of these pockets of research that stood alone, but as I was immersed in it, I said, you know what, these are all pieces of a whole because they all describe some aspect of what bonds or connects somebody in what we call relationship. So I created this model to kind of give a visual of the major connectors that occur in your relationships. And because they're on ranges, go up and down, they help to visualize actually profiles. But theoretically, each one is a unique contributor to how you form a bond. So if you could just isolate one of them, it would actually be uh, bonding on its own, every single one. And, uh, but they're different. Uh, how you know somebody is different than how you trust them. Can't you know somebody really well and trust them very little? 
Sure, right. Those are your professors. And, sure. Uh, <laughs> And uh, did you ever, get this one, did you ever get assigned to work in a group, like, you know, four other students and you have a group project, and your grade in the class all depends on this group project? Do you ever get that? Don't you hate that one? <laughs> because then you're highly dependent on somebody, and you look around at your group and you're like, oh my gosh, I know that person really well. No trust at all. <laughs> and my grade depends on them? Oh my goodness. So, anyway. You know what I'm talking about. These are all very different, but they, they all are unique contributors to a bond. I'll give you a quick example. If, if you could just isolate one of them, which is near impossible, you would find that every single one on its own contributes to a bond. I was, um, uh, I was flying from Cleveland, this was about 10 years ago, and that was when we lived in Ohio, and I was flying to Concordia University. I was actually teaching uh, graduate students this program. Uh, I was training them in a, in a couple day training. And um, I sat down on the airplane, and this, I think she was probably in her late 50s, early 60s, this woman uh, gets on, and she had, like, arms full of packages. So I thought she went shopping, but, you know, we're in Cleveland, Ohio. I couldn't figure out why, why we could go shopping in Cleveland, Ohio. But um, it looked like she had just gone shopping and was going home. So when our eyes kind of connected before she sat down next to me, I said, um, are you going home now from some trip? And um, she puts the packages away, she sits down, and she goes, huh. Oh, no, I am so jazzed up. She says, I am going back to St. Louis. That's where my kids live. I haven't seen my grandbabies. I moved to Cleveland because of a job. Uh, I was divorced, and I had to come to take this job in Cleveland. I haven't seen my grandkids for over a year. I bought them all these presents, and I'm so excited to see them. I can't wait. I'm sure they've grown. They don't look the same. She just rummaging through her purse to show me what? Pictures, Pictures before iPhone. So she uh, pulls out this... Uh, actually, she pulls out a photo album, not like one picture. And she goes, let me show you my grandbabies. I'm like, oh, okay. So um, she starts on page one, and she starts showing me her grandkids. Well, literally, like 20 minutes later, we're flying in the air now. And she finishes, and I've been doing what I call bobblehead grunt language, right? So show me that, show me that bobblehead grunt language. Mm. And she gets done with, and I, I probably, you know, did you ever talk to somebody that talks so much that by the time they're done talking, you, you are like worn out. You, you, know, you don't really want to talk. And so I was just kind of like still bobbing. And she goes, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. I, I think I'm manic. I'm so excited. I don't even know your name. So um, I told her my name. And she said, what are you doing? And um, I said, well, I'm uh, actually flying through St. Louis and going on to Concordia University. She goes, oh, what are you doing there? I go, well... I wrote a, uh, you know, I've written some programs, and I'm actually teaching some students uh, one of the programs I wrote. She says, well, what kind of program? Is this like a business program or something? And I said, no, no, it's, a, it's about relationships, actually. And she goes, oh, really? What's it called? I go, well, it's not the typical title. It's called How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk. She goes, oh, my gosh, where were you when I needed you? I've been married five times. <laughs> so I just want you to kind of watch this. So I saw all her grandkids and her kids. She told me stories and I saw the pictures. And then she says this. Let me tell you about my first husband. So this is going now where? Up even higher. 40 minutes later we land. She's gone through five marriages. I've learned everything about her. And uh, when we stand up to leave, what do you think she does when she says goodbye? Yeah. She gives me a little hug. I put it crooked because I did hug her back. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys know why, right? Because I figured out it, it doesn't take much in a guy for her to, like, fall in love. She, she only looks for one quality, which is what? The guy has to what? Listen. Listen, right? What have I been doing for two hours? Listen. Walking into a trap. So <laughs> that's what I did. So, but this is my point in that kind of real story. I mean, that was a real life experience. But I just want you to know, these can be two-way streets. In a relationship, you know, I get to know you and you get to know me. I develop a trust in you and you develop a trust in me. I, I take care of your needs and you take care of my needs. We have reciprocity. These things are reciprocal. But even if it's just one way, she got, you know, self-disclosed. She did not get to know me. 
But I learned a lot of things about her. She felt known, and because of just feeling known, she felt bonded. Each of these, if you think about it, are a very powerful, unique contributor. If you want to know what is my relationship, you can go to this and you can start moving these levels and really creating a picture of what is going on between you and another person in your relationship. So there are key things to get to know. I would say the getting to know is kind of on the left side, and as you, there's a little bit of know and trust, we'll see, because we'll talk about that. But then as you keep moving toward the right, you get into more the, the heart of how you meet each other's needs, what you believe about each other, and how you take care of each other, and how you invest yourself and are committed, and how you're attracted to the person and actually engage in any type of affectionate to sexual touch. The head and the heart are really portrayed in this model in terms of these major connectors that happen in relationships. So I, I want to focus on five key areas, and I'm only going to cover two of the five this afternoon, but five key areas that are strong predictors of what a person would be like in a long-term relationship, particularly marriage. So, um, and there are those things. In fact, I'll just tell you, I was in the mid-90s, I was teaching a, a graduate um, in a graduate program, as well as my private practice. And it was an interesting experience. I was teaching, you know, like students like yourself, that were going to be professionals out in the field of counseling and psychology. And the courses I was teaching were called um, marriage and family assessment courses. So I was teaching individual marriage and family assessment, which is basically how to play detective, sit down with somebody, ask them a bunch of questions, give them some kind of an inventory, and figure out what they're like now and what you can predict about them down the road. That's assessment. It's like profiling in terms of detective work. All right? So um, I would teach these you know, future professionals. Here are topic areas that research has shown to be highly predictive of what a person will be like in marriage and family. If you ask these questions, it helps to unearth these qualities in this person. And you can predict how this person is acting and what they're going to be like. You can make an accurate assessment of this person. I would leave my course, go to my private practice, sit down, and I would talk to a client that was in a relationship. And as I'm talking to this client in the relationship, I would ask them, you know, how well do you feel like you know this person? Oh, I know them really well. And then I would go to some of those topic areas. And I'd say, have you talked much about this? Well, no, not really. Well, how about this? No, not really. Why don't you ask these questions? And I found that I was teaching clients the exact same areas to explore that I was teaching future professionals. And I concluded a lot of what we do in relationships is we try to make an assessment of what this person is like. The getting to know process is a murky process where people don't know what exactly to look at. So I catalog literally a little over a thousand research articles in theory that talk about major predictors of marital outcomes that could be explored and understood before you ever engage in marriage. Early on, even in the dating relationship, these are areas you can get to know about somebody that help to foreshadow what they're going to be like. So the first of these five areas, and I put them in an acronym just to make it easy for people to remember, but the first of the five areas is family. So uh, we're going to talk just for a couple minutes about um, some areas to get to know about family background, but let me start with the idea that, that your family stuff is very important in who, the, who you are, and how you, how you act, and how you're going to act in marriage. Um, all of us came from some kind of upbringing. Uh, we maybe had uh, two biological parents, or maybe we had uh, adopted parents, or foster parents, or a, a single parent, or uh, like my friend um, in California, his mom was married five times and his dad was married eight times while he was growing up. And so he had 13 exchanges. Um, we have all kinds of differences, but the, but the similarity between him, you, and me is that all of us were born and grew up and had these experiences of family and relationships. So how has that impacted you? Well, it's interesting. There's a, another meta-study that was done in 2014, so very recent, that looked at um, 
for about the last 25 years, what happened, uh, what studies have shown what influenced Americans in their attitudes toward marriage? So what has influenced your attitude toward marriage? Because the attitude toward marriage has a very big impact on what people do in marriage. So they said, let's look at all of the studies that looked at influences of people's attitudes toward marriage among American population. What was interesting to me in this study is that just about every study that showed this factor has influenced attitude toward marriage came from family background. So the parents, and most of them came from parents' relationships. So the parents' relationship, their, their discord, whether their arrangement was that they were married or they're cohabiting, or whether they were separated, um, whether they had a certain marital quality, a good quality, whether they, how they fought. Studies revealed these were the things that really influenced what people think about marriage and the attitudes that they have. And we know that many of these attitudes then greatly impact what happens in their marriage. So there are three major areas of family background that we could talk about. We're going to talk just about the first one. Family roles, we won't have time to really go into, but you know what you learned about the, the role of, a, of what a father does, like a parent, what a father or mother does, uh, what a spouse does, um, how children behave, all these things were impacted and shaped by your upbringing. Same with power. I don't know if you ever thought about it. Is there a power distribution in, in, uh, in relationships? Yeah? Have you ever seen, like... Someplace a family where uh, one person was obviously in charge. Did you ever see a family where the kid's in charge? Did you ever see that? Go to like, I don't know, Walmart or Kmart or something. Just hang out for a while. You'll see all kinds of families come in. One of them will have a family where the kid's in charge. And you'll see, you'll be like, mm. <laughs> balance of power over there. Power distribution. We learn, we learn a lot about sharing power, how decisions are made, how we, but I found a lot of people don't know how to date somebody and figure out what they believe about the sharing of power. They don't even know how to explore that. That's something that's put way off, but that's a critical part of what predicts how the person's going to be and that's been shaped by their family background. We're just going to talk about how you handle your emotions and how you give and receive love. So, um, not to turn this into group therapy, but um, to, to step a little bit into your own life, um, what was an emotion that you learned something about when you grew up? And uh, what is the emotion and what did you learn about it? So somebody raise their hand and tell me an emotion that you learned something about from the family you grew up in. Kindness. The kindness. What did you learn about kindness from the family you grew up in? Uh, if, if other people in the family are exhibiting it, then... So if somebody's showing kindness, that's a good quality. So it, it was kind of raised up as, you know, you need to, you need to act like uh, your brother. Or you need to do this. You know, they show kindness, you need to do it too. It's another emotion somebody learned something about, yeah. Yeah, yeah it'd be kind of an attitude emotion, you know. Attitude is belief and feeling all mingled together. What, did, what was it that you learned about respect from the family you grew up in? So respect becomes critical. You know, I put respect kind of under the umbrella of trust and respect, you know. So what you're kind of saying is if respect isn't there, then a lot of other things are going to fall by the wayside. You know, respect really becomes critical. So somebody else. Yeah. Hey, anger. What did you learn about anger? I learned anger from my family. I mean, like, um, <laughs> you had a very angry family. It's okay. Yeah, like, like how to deal with anger appropriately. So give us one example of of something you learned about dealing for one time. <laughs> well, now they're handing you the microphones. <laughs> I'm sorry. The animals of the students. So an example of what exactly? Sorry. Uh oh. Okay, now that you have the mic, we want to know the worst example. Well, I mean, <laughs> no, no. Just an example of something that you learned about mm. anger. Um, yeah, just you know, if you if you're like, I think I learned um, just. Uh, Appropriate ways to express anger, so not yelling and stuff like that. Just yeah, 
more more on the negative side and uh, what not to do with anger. Did, did your family, um, was it a two-parent family, single-parent yeah, family? Yeah, uh, two-parent. Two-parent? Yeah. And did, did they model that? Like, did their yeah, own yeah, I mean, they didn't, they didn't really yell or anything like that, so. So, so they, they kind of like set the tone mm -hmm. of how anger would be handled. Yeah. Did they actually ever talk to you about it? Like, what's your, what's your first name? Jay, sorry, yeah. Jay. Mm -hmm. um, oh gosh. Did you say Jay or Jane? Jay, sorry. Jay. Yeah, they, they did talk to me about it um, at certain points. Jay? We know that you're angry. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're allowed to be angry. Just stop beating on your brother. That's very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't known you very long, but. <laughs> yeah. It's just. So, we learn a lot about emotion, right? I appreciate it, Jay, by the way. If you guys start thinking about it, it's not just emotion, it's also how you give and receive love. These are things that the templates were first being formed. And I'm not saying you can't ever change. You know, I, I believe in change. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a quick example from my own life. Um, partly because uh, when you go into psychology, in fact, there's a, you know, it's kind of a stereotype. People go into psychology for what reason? Yeah, right, they're all messed up, right, so now you know about my life. So, um, but, uh, you know, if you're going to do any kind of counseling correctly, then you've got to at least um, do a little bit on your own self. You've got you to be open up to that. And um, particularly when I was writing this material and looking at all of this, I thought a lot about my own family background. So, I came from a family of five. I had four siblings. And um, as my... Uh, Life entered into junior high. Um, our family kind of changed dramatically. We lived in Ohio. Uh, we weren't um, farmers. My dad, uh, we lived on a farm, but my, my dad was a salesman. And um, it was more of like a pleasure farm that we lived on. And my uh, older brother and sister were um, getting ready to go off to college. She had already been in college for a couple years. He was going for his freshman year. Uh, this, the, the late summer when my mom passed away. She had been struggling with cancer for about two years. And um, my father was uh, kind of the, the greatest generation guy who know anything about it. He fought in World War II. And um, he was not the type to, to come up to you and say he loved you or hugged you or anything like that. He had a good sense of humor. He was kind of a warm person. But he was, he was more um, awkward when it came to expression of affection in any kind of way. And so I don't think my brother and I got many hugs or love yous at all from my dad while we were growing up. But my mom was much more expressive. She was kind of the classic, you know, nurturing mom that would say it, would hug you and put her arm around you and things like that. So when my mom passed away, this might sound a little odd, but I can remember in the winter just my dad and I being in this six-bedroom old farmhouse in the middle of a cold winter kind of feeling this need that, you know, the connection between me and my, my dad was missing. And so um, I thought, you know, I, I would like to hear my dad express himself, say I love you to me. And so uh, I plotted out how to get my dad to say I love you, because that wasn't his thing. <laughs> so um, I don't know if you had parents like this, most of you probably did not, but um, I, I decided if I say I love you to my father, then he would probably say it back. So I can remember going to him one evening when I was 15 years old and saying, Dad, uh, I'm getting ready to go to bed now. And he looked over the newspaper and he said, OK, John, good night. And I said, before I go to bed, I just want to say something. He goes, what's that? And I go, Dad, I want to tell you I love you. Uh -huh. Well, at that moment, he got this really awkward look like, what did you just what, what, that is not allowed in this house. <laughs> you know? And he goes, uh, me too. <laughs> so I go to bed, and I think to myself, well, that didn't turn out the way I was hoping. I love him, and he loves himself too. <laughs> Who loves me? So, you know, there's this thing where when you do something awkward like that, particularly with your parent, you're like, man, I am not going there again. So years went by. Um, actually, in my family, things changed dramatically. Uh, my dad, uh, I think, was deep down grieving over the loss of his wife. Uh, he had known her since actually early elementary school. They had been childhood friends, and then 
became um, childhood sweethearts as they were graduating from high school. And um, they had this long life together. And he didn't deal well with his emotions. And he wasn't able to express himself real well. And so he meets another woman by springtime. And within, you know, two and a half months, he's married. So my brother and my sister leave literally a week after mom's funeral and come home to a stepmom. And um, our family changed dramatically. And I never went back to my dad and said, I love you, or tried to hug him or anything. I just became very independent at that time of life. And uh, right when I was graduating college, I had a major change in my life. I became very exposed to uh, quite a number of families that I think had good relationships. And I began to see uh, a number of men say they love you, you know, I love you to their sons. Uh, they were more expressive. And I, I remember saying to myself, I'm going to be like that as a man. I want to change. So the uh, best place to do it is with my dad. So when I was going off to college, I'd be like, Dad, I'm, I'd catch a Greyhound bus back then, going off to Miami University. So my dad would reach out his hand and shake my hand. So I'd grab his hand, pull him in, give him a big bear hug, and be like, Dad, I love you. And he'd say, me too. So off I'd go to college. <laughs> then I'd come home. Every time I came home on a break, what would my dad do? Reach out and shake my hand. I'd pull him in, give him a big bear hug. I'd say, Dad, I love you. Sometimes I'd even hold him a little bit longer. <laughs> Just probably, probably passive aggressive, but I <laughs> could have been. But eventually my father started to say, I love you too. And as time went on, um, probably the last time he was in our home, at least one of the last times, he had uh, some Parkinson's. And um, I remember he, he, he came in the door and he sees me at the other end of the house and he puts his arms out and he, had, he didn't have the shakes with Parkinson. He had... You might say he's, he's all stiff. And he started scooching his way over to me like this. And about 30 minutes later, we, we hugged. <laughs> no, that would be torture, wouldn't it? But I just ask you this. Who do you think changed the most? My father or his son, John? Me. Who changed the most? His son. Yeah, I changed the most. Because I made an intentional decision that I wanted to be different. I said, the hardest person to hug and say I love you, the hardest person to do that with will be my father. So I'm going to start there. And I find that I can go up to a lot of people. I can give people hugs. I'm comfortable with that. It changed my life. And I want you to know that you can change ways that your family has impacted how you think about yourself, how you think about relationships. These things can be re remolded, but it's going to be intentional. It's going to be taking work. It doesn't just happen automatically. And when you're dating somebody, don't assume that they automatically are different than the family they've come from. Most likely, if they have not intentionally tried to change something from the family they've come from, they're going to replicate it. And it may not be visible while you're dating. It may be like a little dormant seed just hiding inside of them. But as time goes on, those seeds of how the family has shaped them will probably start coming out in terms of their attitudes and their behaviors. So it's really critical that you explore family stuff when you're dating. I think this is the, the best time in your life to kind of look back on how was I influenced by my family? What do I like? What do I want to repeat? What do I want to revise? When we're dating people, we should be talking about this long before we're, quote, engaged, thinking about marriage. Family stuff is critical to get to know. And in the process of getting to know that, there's a second area that you need to get to know, and it's also an area that was greatly shaped in the family. The conscience. I don't know if you guys ever think about the conscience. I, I found that hardly anybody wrote about when you're dating how to figure out a person's conscience. You guys ever read something like that? But the conscience is extremely predictive of what people are going to be like in a long-term relationship, particularly in a marriage. So let's just start with the concept of the conscience first, and we'll just develop that quickly, and then we'll explore this question of how do you get to know somebody's conscience, okay? So what is the conscience? Somebody help me out here. So there's a, a, a morality, we'll call it a moral code, all right, so people have certain values and beliefs and morals. Conscience is something even more than that. So that's part of it. What's another 
part of what the conscience, how would you define the conscience? Kind of influences you towards certain decisions that you think to be right, or it stings you when you're, when you're doing things that you think are wrong. Yeah, that's very good. So there's, there's this kind of influence. There's a, thousands of years ago, the Greeks are the ones that coined the term that is translated to conscience. And it's interesting, it actually, their word literally was two minds working together. One mind is living life and the other one is observing it. It's the metacognitive faculty you have, process that you have, where you kind of watch yourself and you observe and make judgments. And you tell yourself according to your moral code, or maybe even according to how other people feel, uh, don't do that, or that's a good thing to do. You ought to do this. So it, it is the self-appraisal system, appraising and evaluating you. It's that little voice in your head. Do you ever have this where you're talking, and the little voice tells you to stop talking? Don't say that. Did you ever have that? <laughs> that's your conscience. It's like, I mean, literally, you might not hear a voice. Some of you are like, yeah, I hear voices all the time. <laughs> Medicine for that, don't, don't talk to me, but do follow through and talk to somebody about it. But it's, a, it's, like this, it's like this mental activity where you're observing yourself. Did you ever ask where you're talking? And it's like this little voice in your head says, John, stop, don't say that. And it's like your, your mouth is rebelling against your conscience. It says, I'm going to say it. And you're like, just shut up. Up, John. No, I'm going to say it. And then everything goes into slow motion. And your mouth goes like, I need more, yeah, more. And your conscience is like, what did you just do? Do you have this? <laughs> that's your conscience. Some of you are like, no, I've never had that. Well, that's because you're a sociopath. <laughs> you have no conscience. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They, they, don't, they, they don't attend Princeton, they go to Columbia. But um, <laughs> he was just at Columbia presenting. No. But you know what I'm saying is that the conscience is this faculty. So in psychology, they call it like your self-regulatory system. How we manage ourselves and regulate ourselves. Uh, an interesting uh, willpower, uh, impulse control. Going all the way back to Walter Mischel, who um, actually did uh, an early uh, test that became a classic experiment called the Marshmallow Study. I don't know if you guys ever heard this. This was actually a delay of gratification, a function of the conscience. Can your conscience help to suppress your impulse to eat a marshmallow? Well, you'd be like, yeah, I can do that, but how about if you're three, four, or five years old? So that's what Mitchell did, is he got these little you know, four-year-olds, put them in a chair, and put a marshmallow in front of them and said, if you want to eat the marshmallow, you can go ahead. But you won't get any more. If you don't eat the marshmallow, if you wait until I come back in the room, then I'll give you two marshmallows and you can have two. So you can either have one right now, or if you can wait, I'll give you two. And then he went out of the room for like 15 to 20 minutes. Which is a long time for a three and a four year old to sit there. And the interesting thing is how they related to the marshmallow. You know, some of them wouldn't even look at it. Like, if I don't look at it, it doesn't exist. I'm not tempted. Others would stare at it. I just stare at it. Don't eat. Don't eat. So they've re replicated this many, many times. And it's interesting because this is all understanding what the conscience does and how we have different ranges of maturity in our conscience. But uh, watch this experiment replicate. Pay attention to how these kids relate to the marshmallow. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you another so they don't have to. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? All right.
stay in the chair, okay? Okay. Stanford University as his own children. So uh, it was probably about 10 years later, 12 years later, when his kids were in the end of high school, that he would hear them talking. And one of his kids would talk about, you know, you know, James, we'll say. And um, he'd say, well, how's James doing in school? And he'd be, oh, James is screwing up big time. He flunked this class. And he's like, Walter Mitchell would be like, James, I remember James ate the marshmallows. <laughs> <laughs> and he's starting to get intrigued from hearing his kids talk about other kids that he had done this experiment on 10, 12 years earlier. I wonder if those that ate the marshmallow predicts anything now a decade later of life. And that really became the classic study. He actually collected all of those kids back, brought them in, evaluated how they were doing in numerous areas of life from their studies, their relationships, their identity, their self-esteem, all these different areas, and found major correlations between the kids that ate the marshmallow and having difficulties from the kids that didn't eat the marshmallow, from the kids that actually kicked, so he started then fine-tuning it. Studies have continued since his study in the late uh, uh, 70s. And um, studies have continued for 20, 30 years on this area of the conscience. What I found is the majority of these studies are stuck in the library shelves. But they are so important to your life. There are studies that have shown that at age 11, the functioning of the conscience was the strongest predictor of marital quality and longevity. As strong of a predictor in all the factors that they looked at, as physical uh, predictors like heart disease predictors, things that are now known as staple predictors out there in the, the physical health world. But in the relationship health world, the conscience is one of the strongest predictors. Because just think about it. If you're in a relationship with somebody and their self-monitoring system, how they regulate themselves according to their moral code, what their moral code is, how they control their impulses, how they actually think about you and what you're going through and how their behavior is going to impact you, all right? If you're in a relationship with somebody and that conscience in them functions very poorly, what's one area that's definitely going to be compromised? Trust. So trust is going to go down, right? What's another area that is just going to be hard to keep strong in your relationship? Sure, because you're not, going to, you're not going to know whether you can rely on them to even meet your needs and be there for you. So three out of the five areas. So I, I ask this question. If the conscience is important, and that's what the conscience is all about, how can you figure out somebody's conscience? Well, if, I could give you a lot of details, but I'm just going to give you a principle of how to figure out a person's conscience. So I'm going to do it kind of in a story form because I think it's easier to kind of think this way. Um, my oldest daughter, when she was 15 years old, uh, I remember she got asked out on a first date. So she was getting ready. So like kind of a typical teenager, um, she's getting ready for the date. It's important to her to look good. So if her room was clean at noon and she got picked up at 6 o'clock, what did her bedroom look like at 6 o'clock, do you think? <laughs> what was, what, why? What was going on in her bedroom? Clothes everywhere. She tried all kinds of things on. So what time do you think she started getting ready to go out on her date, her first date? 
Yeah. <laughs> Dude, you, you don't know my daughters. No, she was like, by noon, she was thinking about it. So um, there she is. She's getting ready to go out. And uh, so she goes out. It was a nice evening. I remember it was in the fall. But when she comes home, it was actually raining out. She comes in the door probably around 11, 11.30, and, it, and she's soaking wet. And I remember my wife and I said, you know, what's going on? Why are you wet? She goes, let me tell you what happened. So, man, we're like, boy, you know, turn the TV off. I mean, this is why you have children, by the way. <laughs> Just to have entertainment of life. That's what it's all about, okay? So we're like, turn the TV off. We're like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what happened? So she tells us that she went to the movie with this guy. And it was, it was fairly nice. It was real crowded, and they parked kind of far away. But when they came out of the movie, you know, 10, 30, 11 at night, whatever, it's pouring down rain. And she goes, we come to the door. It's like this big glass door. You can see it's just pouring down rain. His car's way over there. I look at him, and he looks at me. And for a moment, as we look at each other, I think, oh, he gets me. Which means what? He's going to go get the car. And she goes, but then he spoke. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I'll race you to the car. Yes. So she's good hearted and she's like, uh, okay, whatever. So she's running to the car. Okay, but it doesn't end there. She gets to the car, she goes to open the door, figuring that she wants to beat him, but the door's locked. So she looks around and all of a sudden the light comes on in the car, which means what? He's, in. He's getting in his side. It goes off and then it comes back on. She goes, I'm soaking wet by that time. My hair is drenched. So I figure, what is he doing in there? So she cleans the window, looks inside, and what do you think he's doing? Taking a picture. Taking a picture. So he, that's a guy right there. That, no! No, he wasn't even being malicious. He was combing his own hair. Because he wanted to what? He wanted to look good. So this is, this is the question. Big deal or little deal? What do you guys say? So we have a debate going on. Some say big, some say little. Now, if you were her father, because I, I speak from a guy's perspective, so if you're a female, you can think of your mother. Big deal or little deal from a parent perspective? All right. How many parents do we have in the room? <laughs> right. Big deal, little deal. Me? Yeah. What? For me, big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine things are supposed to change. Women are equal to men. So for women, it's no longer a big deal, right? Yeah. I expect my wife to open the door for me. <laughs> well, you know, this is how it ended. We give her a hug that night. She goes to bed. As a dad, I figure I'm never going to hear this guy's name in the house again. Because she was kind of like done. A couple weeks later, she's getting ready to go out. I'm like, where are you going? I'm going out. Who are you going out with? And she says his name. Which I'll tell you, you guys, for future parents in the room, you need to get a hobby when you parent your children. Because their life can disturb you. So if you have a hobby, it will help you cope with things that bother you. Because I was like, why are you, I was thinking this, why are you going out with this guy again? So my wife and I went into gun collecting at that time of life. It was very, very helpful. But this is what, you gotta know when I'm kidding, right? <laughs> so this is what I want to say to you, though. After a couple weeks, we heard another story from Morgan about something that went on with this guy. Because I know what happened in her mind. She thought as time went on, you know, even the weekend, I am making a big deal out of a little deal. You know, so he didn't, didn't you know, open my door. He didn't bring the car around. You know, what am I, a prima donna? Making a big deal out of a little deal. But after a couple weeks, we heard another story, another little deal, something else that seemed to be similar, but had nothing to do with rain or, or any of that. 
And then a couple weeks later, another little deal. And over a, a few months of them being together, the little deals began to what? Become bigger. They began to add up. And what did little deals reveal? We're gonna, I'm going to call it a, a major theme of the conscience. You can get to know somebody's conscience, not necessarily from things that happen as a huge, big deal. But it, oftentimes, we're getting to know somebody's conscience by watching how little deals add up over time. In fact, there was an interesting study, again, about narcissism. I had mentioned about how it increases. Um, and I think that it, these studies, a lot of times, are done on college campuses. But I would project that narcissism may be increasing in our society at large. But this was an interesting study. And I just want to read one quote. This is another study that was done in 2014. People that score high in narcissism make positive first impressions. Based on short social interactions, brief video clips, still photography, people that score high in narcissism are initially perceived as attractive, agreeable, competent, well-adjusted, and popular. However, the social interaction partners begin to rate these people more negatively after repeated interactions once they get to know what they're really like. I think that it takes time to really get to know somebody. And over time, you begin to figure out whether you can trust them or not. So I want to take a few minutes and talk about trust. I'm going to leave the areas to get to know. The family stuff, we only kind of skim the surface of that and the conscience. But two major areas that are extremely predictive of how people are going to behave over the trajectory of life, particularly in relationships. But what is trust? So I'm going to give you a working definition of trust and talk about the difference between trust and no, and try to develop that for a minute. I think it's interesting, there is a, there's a general principle we can apply here, and it goes like this. If you look at this, you can begin to understand vulnerability. If you get to know somebody here, but your trust goes a lot higher, does that create vulnerability, yes or no? Yeah. Can you see it? You might say to yourself, why would anybody trust somebody way more than what they know them? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But is this vulnerable, depending on somebody that you don't know or trust real well? So you can start to create a profile of lack of safety or vulnerability. It's the same with commitment. If you start investing in a relationship, and you say, well, who does that? Well, some people have to be in a relationship. So they're very unhappy, they get in a relationship, and then they drop all their friends and become hyper-focused, and they're highly invested in a relationship with somebody that the knowing and the trusting and even the reciprocity of meeting needs hasn't developed. And have you ever, ever seen this anywhere? Again, at Columbia. <laughs> Is this unsafe? What's one way that having sex with somebody you don't know or trust very well We'll all, everybody in the room, in fact, I'd say everybody on campus will agree, it's a higher vulnerability, there's a higher risk of having sex when you don't know or trust them. What's a risk for what? STDs. STDs and what else? Pregnancy. Pregnancy, right? So I'm not saying that risk isn't ever there, but I just want you to see that this model that depicts what happens in relationships, when you're talking about building a new relationship, you start to get a guiding principle of safeness. If we are getting to know somebody and we bring our trust down so that it stays in line with what we get to know, and we make sure to not become overly invested and go too far physically and start meeting needs, if we help these things to grow together, we build a relationship in a zone that actually is the safest and maximizes judgment of what we get to know. So as we get to know those areas of family and conscience and the other three, we're getting to know stuff more clear-minded, more clear-focused. But as soon as these levels get out of balance, so what is trust? I find that today, relationships tend to get built backwards. Even this, between these two, 
they get built backwards. Trust develops way faster in relationships today than what people take to get to know. So I'm going to give you a working definition of trust. Trust is going to be a feeling of safety and confidence you have in a person that comes from what you think or believe about them. It's not necessarily what you know. It's what you believe about them. So I could almost say it like this. If you were going to a, a surgeon to do a, a, a life critical surgery on you, and you believed that this surgeon was the absolute best surgeon around, your belief, even though you don't know anything about them personally, your belief is going to give you a greater feeling of confidence and safety. And um, you're not going to have to interview them and get to know them on, an, on a personal level. You know, they're not going to be wheeling you down towards surgery and you grab the surgeon's hand and say, uh, we're starting to go out, but how's your marriage today? Did you have a fight with your wife? Are you in a good mood? You, know, you don't have to know all this because you have a belief. Trust is a feeling that comes from a belief that you have about uh, a person. And that belief is like a, a representation. It's like a picture in your mind that shows you what that person is like. So there's like people inside your head that represent the people you know. That produces expectations. So if you know somebody and they're always happy, then you know, you're kind of imagining going to see them and they're happy. If they're crazy, then you're like, oh my gosh, you know, they're scary people to be around. You know, so-and-so's going to be there tonight? Eh, I don't know. If they're uh, messy, wait a minute. How did my granddaughter get into my slides? You will learn this when you become grandparents. You take every opportunity to put your grandchildren in every presentation you do. Why? Just because you're proud of your grandchildren. So this is my granddaughter at her first birthday, or uh, second birthday, I should say, I'm sorry. And um, this is her swinging. And so I'm going to use her as a quick example. Her, her name is Effie. And um, how many of you uh, have studied attachment theory? Any, any in a, well, object relations theory? Object, I found the object relations theory. So I'm going to give you a little bit of theory, describe what trust is, and then we're going to bring it all back to dating and make sure you understand how it fits in. But you've got to understand concepts before you can see how those concepts are so vital in your experience uh, and in your relationships. So, attachment theory says that uh, an infant begins to form some kind of a connection, an attachment to a caregiver, and as that infant grows, they form what they call mental representations. Object relations theory took that idea and went into it big time and said, when a baby is born into this world, they don't have pictures in their mind to represent objects in the world. So... Uh, recognition doesn't happen. You know, recognition is comparing what they see with the picture in their head. So um, if, a, if a newborn is playing with this and um, you want them to stop, all you need to do is take it away and hide it. Because out of sight, then it's what? Out of mind. So they, they're not like, where did that go? Give it back to me. Because they don't have a picture representing it. Piaget, other learning theorists, um, felt that somewhere around the third or the fourth month, uh, newborns uh, heading into the toddler years, these babies, were starting this process of forming pictures to represent objects and even people, you know, people or objects in the world. So they began to have facial recognition. So somewhere around that time, they found that babies would see mama, and without any, um, you know, prompting, just on recognition, oh, there's mama, or there's daddy, they'd smile. And they'd be like, oh, they're smiling because they recognize me, because they have a picture representing me. So they've done a lot of experiments that I think are all very interesting. But there is a game that um, probably you've played if you have younger siblings, if you remember this time, or if you have any older siblings that had a baby, or your, you know, an aunt or an uncle. Uh, you know, for me, I was a grandpa with Effie when she was probably around five months old. This game started to be played during this about year-long process of her forming pictures to represent objects in the world. You'd be like, where's, where's Papa's head? Where's Papa's head? <gasps> what would you say? Peekaboo, peek right? Did you ever see a little infant when you play peekaboo? This is what they look like. You go, where's my head? Where's my head? Peekaboo, they go like this. <laughs> you know what that is? 
trauma. <laughs> <laughs> You traumatize them because they don't have a clear picture in their mind of your face, your head. So when you do this, do you realize what you're doing? Decapitating yourself. I have cut my head off, little girl. And then when you go peekaboo, it sounds like this. And if you talk, they'd be like, Papa, don't, don't cut your head off again. But you, but you laugh. <laughs> and they laugh. You think they're laughing because they're having fun. They're just relieved. You still have a they're like, oh, you got a head. Okay, don't do that again. But you're all sick people, so you do it over and over, don't you? Where's my head? Oh my gosh, I don't know. You cut it off again. You can do it a hundred times. The hundred and first time, you go, where's my head? Peekaboo. They'll do that same reaction. Because... They're really not learning. They haven't reached that maturity of developing a picture in their head. They say, well, what does this have to do with dating? I say, it has everything to do with the formation of new relationships. You don't have a blank slate in your mind. You've got lots of people you've known. We'll call those associations. Things that you will compare with. You have stereotypes. You have ideals. Things that you really want in a person. You meet somebody, and you don't know them very well. And as you talk and you start to get to know them, you learn things about them. But every piece that you learn, you start to construct a very elaborate picture. And you take out of your databases, you know, your stereotypes and association, and you start making a very complex picture. If they say all the right things and do all the right things, where does your trust picture go in them? It goes way up, doesn't it? And even though you know them down here, it feels like you know them up here. But what's up here is a picture. You might want to say it like this. In the beginning of a relationship, it's kind of like you, you learn the Facebook version of the person. All right? This is their Facebook version. And so if you're going out with them, you're going out with the Facebook version. And as time goes on, you begin to get the real version of who they really are. But as you get to know them, this can go crashing down. So it becomes up to you to make sure that you try to bring your, your belief about them in line with what you actually know and not what you're filling in the gaps. I would say this. For the beginning of a relationship, the first couple months for sure, you are way more in a relationship with a representation than a reality. You're dating their representative self, not their real self. And you say, well, are they faking it? No, it's just, it's just because you're getting to know them. And it takes time to get to know people. In fact, I'll submit to you that if you look at research, patterns of people's behavior do not start emerging until somewhere around the third month. And you're not trying to get to know incidences. You want to know the, the, the patterns of who they really are. And they're probably, if they like you, they're probably putting their best foot forward anyway. So in the first you know, two and a half, three months, you're more in like a probation period where things are not fully revealed and you're getting to know them. Now, I would just say, talk to people that have been dating for a few months. You'll find that these areas are way more accelerated than down here. But their actual knowing of each other is way lower. It's probably down here of how much they really know because you can jot this down. There's three T's to getting to know somebody. You've you got to talk, but it takes time, and it takes some togetherness. And if you spend time in togetherness, then you start to really see the patterns of how they act, and it starts revealing the true self. So the knowing requires talking, but also time and togetherness. Well, let me just close. I have about two, three minutes left. So um, that's long enough to talk about sex. So... Like that, we came for that topic. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but in the word touch is the word ouch. Touch is very bonding. And in any kind of relationship, when we're talking about um, sexual touch, uh, we know from brain science oxytocin, vasopressin, dopamine levels. We know all kinds of things that we've learned about the impact of sexual chemistry, sexual attraction, uh, sexual skin on skin touch. Uh, the act of making love, how it actually activates the brain. In a simple way, everything that we know from the social sciences, 
to the brain studies of the anatomy of biological functioning. Everything that we know about sexuality so far points to the fact that sex prompts bonding in relationships. It produces a sense uh, of biological state, a chemical state, of feeling of connection. It also produces uh, a, a feeling of closeness that overrides a lot of judgment. We have interesting studies that look at how people, when they engage in some kind of a sexual activity, how their attitude toward the person changes. They override complaints and criticisms. So they don't see things as clearly. Uh, things that bothered them before begin to get diminished. So the old saying of kiss and make up, you know, kiss and get over it, has truth when it comes to the social biological sciences. There's three studies that I just want to point out that are in a realm of studies that are about um, sexual activity and dating and marital outcomes. And these studies um, very much go along with the idea that the sexual act is a really powerful bonding uh, experience between people. That when you do it, it has um, impact not only on your present relationship, but it seems to have impact on future relationships. So it has impact on how your relationship develops, and it has impact on the patterns of your future. So I'm going to give you, very quickly, three studies that I find really interesting, and they're fairly current. The first one was one that was done right in 2010. And in this study, they took couples. So they took several thousand uh, married couples that had been married a minimum of 15 years, and they gave them a whole bunch of inventories to measure the quality of their marriage relationship. So they wanted to see what is their relationship like, how do they get along, um, what is their, um, their intimacy, uh, how well do they meet each other's needs, um, what's their sexual life like, you know. So they gave them these extensive battery of inventories. And then they asked them one question about sex in their premarital relationship or before they got married. What was the timing of your first sexual act? So they wanted to know when did you first have sex. And they gave them nine categories. The first one was, I'll call it BD, before dating. So it was like, kind of like a, a meet or a hookup for a lot of them. The second one was on the first date, uh, the first three weeks, um, three weeks to three months, uh, three months to six months, six months to a year, one to two years, after two years, like, wow, they waited a long time and then had sex. <laughs> and they got married. So, so I think I have nine categories. Yeah. So the researchers then took all of these people, these thousands of couples, and they put them in these different categories. And then they looked at the quality of marriage for each category. How did the quality of marriage compare? And they asked a, a simple statistical question. Is there any significant difference, statistically significant difference between these categories? What do you think they found? Were they all the same? Or did they have differences in their relationships? Differences. They did find differences. And although this might sound old school, they found that Basically, when it came to three major areas, uh, intimacy and communication, mutual need fulfillment, so how they took care of each other, and the sex life, the longer they waited, the higher the qualities in those three areas. Now, this is what I would just suggest to you to think about. I, I read studies like this. Um, in fact, for 20 years now, I have tried to read every study about sexual activity, before marriage and what it says in terms of any predictive qualities it has in marriage. So there's a number of studies that have been done over the last 20 years and even longer that look at the, pre the prediction of sexual activity. What's interesting to me is this. If a couple is holding off, we'll say over here, wh where are they working in their relationship then? And how they talk, know each other, how they develop trust, how they meet each other's needs. So in my model, it just makes sense. If you're going to hold off here, you're going to work over here. 
The thing that really strikes me, I think, that's probably the most uh, uh, thought-provoking about this study, is these are couples 15 plus years after they dated. And the areas that were not emphasized in the beginning of their relationship don't seem to have caught up 15 years into the marriage. So they were still scoring lower. And the couples that went like this scored lower. And the couples that scored higher in these areas had put off. So I think that there is something to be said that as you develop a relationship, what you emphasize for the first year to two years of that relationship and what you build on has permanent lasting impact for the majority of people. That's the trend. And if you um, hold off on something here in terms of the sexual involvement, you begin to build a basis that affects the quality of your relationship, even in that area, even though that area was not developed. There's a second study I just want to mention. And this was an interesting study on men. And it was men not in the US. It was actually uh, four different countries outside the US. And these men, um, they didn't ask about the quality of their marriage. They were all married. They asked them if they ever cheated in their marriage. So um, they wanted to know uh, if these men ever cheated. Obviously, it had no individual indicators, so you couldn't recognize who the men were. It was completely anonymous. And they asked them, how many sexual partners did you have before you got married? So some had zero, some had one, some had two, some had three, four, and so forth. Five, six, seven, eight. Where do you want me to stop? Nine. Thirty. Thirty. So, with each group, then they group the men. There's a, really thousands of men that they put in this study, in this database. And they said, for the men that had zero sexual partners before they got married, what percentage of these married men had cheated in their marriage, had an act of infidelity? Then they took the group of men that had only one sexual partner, and they said, what percentage of these men had cheated, an act of infidelity? And they did that to get what they're doing, right? All the way through. Then they asked a very simple statistical question. Is there any significant difference between these percentages? What do you think they found? All the percentages were non-significant, or did they find significant differences? They did. They found statistically significant differences. And, as you maybe would expect, they found that the lower percentages were down here, and the trend just kept going up, up, up. But the amount of variance accounted for jumped dramatically somewhere around four or five. So these percentages were significantly different, but there's a huge jump when you got you know, four or five and higher. And I don't know why, but I find that, um, I mean, I don't know why there was a huge jump, but I find this congruent with all the other studies. I would challenge you to jump into the research on premarital sexual activity and marital outcomes, or the outcomes in long-term committed relationships. You will find every study that looks at sexual activity in premarital life, every study shows that there is some kind of a predictability or correlation to what people do at this time of life in dating and what happens in outcomes. These are trends. I know this isn't like everybody is locked into a certain outcome. But when you look at trends, you see that it, this model and the application of it makes sense. This model says you need to be responsible for building your relationship. And to build your relationship, you need to have a template of what you're doing. It's kind of like, what does that mean? Well, these are the areas that you're working on. But if you are intentional about saying, hey, we're going to set some boundaries here. You know, my trust goes up. I've been going out with this person. They're phenomenal. Man, I feel awesome. Strong, strong, good chemistry going on with us. But I'm going to pull this down because I need to work through the true getting to know of this person before I really believe wholeheartedly these things about this person. I can't just fill in the gaps. And if I'm intentional about building my bonds with this person in this kind of a way, and I explore the right stuff then you begin to build relationships that actually benefit you and your own life. You find that you grow from them. Even if the relationship doesn't work out, you walk away from it feeling like this has really helped me in my life. These are relationships 
that are not the norm of how people date today. I go through this all the time with singles, and I find that the five areas of getting to know are not areas that are explored, but they are areas that help all of us to grow if we talk about them and work on them. And when we practice developing a relationship more intentionally, you talk to anybody that's married, they will tell you their marriage relationship does not run itself. They've got to run it. But you need to practice running your relationships at this time. The last thing I just kind of want to leave you with is this. What you do in your relationships today, the, the preponderance of research clearly says what you do in your relationships today affect the trajectory of your life and your future. If you look at um, uh, social studies, studies in sociology and economics, you'll find that relationship decisions are one of the strongest predictors of life trajectories. Economy, uh, mental health, uh, resilience, um, on, on and on. Educational pursuits. Relationship decisions affect the trajectory. And what we found in other research is that the patterns of what we do in our relationships today actually become the footprint of what we do in our relationships even in marriage, even 15, 20 years later. How we work on our conscience, how we follow our conscience, how we build a relationship, where we set boundaries and where we emphasize. These things all become predictive of what you're going to have 15 years later. The idea that, you know, life in college is just an island. You know the old saying, what is done in Vegas, what? Stays. Yeah, the idea that what you do in Princeton stays in Princeton is so inaccurate when you look at research. You can have a ton of fun in relationships, but know that relationships that are going to enhance your life and benefit you and be fun for you in are relationships that you're going to run with a sense of responsibility. And when you do that, it's going to really benefit you as well as the person you're involved in. So um, your head and your heart need to what? <coughs> Work together. Work together. So um, let me just take a few questions before we wrap up today. What's yes, ma'am? Could you give her that mic real quick? Oh, the other three indicators. Oh, so, you, so in faces? Yeah. Yeah, I never reveal those because I I, I want people to go get the book. <laughs> um, oh, okay. <laughs> I, honestly, I'll tell you why I don't tell. Um, I used to like because I can present everything in five minutes. You know, I could like give like the overview, but I find that people get inoculated. Like they, they learn it and they, they didn't really work it or develop it or get into it at all. And they're like they're like, um, oh okay, I get it, I get it, okay, good, good. And they walk away and then they dismiss it. And so my hope is that if you like some of the stuff that we went over today, that you really do you know, get the book or other books, but you get into it and you get more you know information because this alone is not going to do enough. You know, no, nobody's going to have drastic changes in their life from, a, from an hour and a half presentation. So, you know, I, I hope that it's more of a, of a like a, you know, an, an enticement. Hey, what the appetite. And if it does, cool. You know, I can tell you, as a man in his latter half of his 50s, uh, you will never regret making, developing healthy relationships a priority in your life. And particularly, love relationships. Yeah, who has a question? Yes, sir. Oh, it's on? It's on. <laughs> uh, so, just based on like the overall kind of question for this, this um, um, which is the, the dearth of dating in Princeton, I kind of like, I, I really enjoyed the talk. I was wondering why there was a little syndrome kind of answer. Um, like what I was thinking of was, why aren't there more fig trees being made on the planet in order to increase the number of days of Princeton? I feel like there's more fig trees being made on the planet. A simpler way, are you talking about dates that you eat? F fig trees. <laughs> for days, yeah. Fig trees for days. Yeah. Well, if those are the dates you want, then you, you should be able to find those. Well, you can't them. find them in Princeton there at the grocery store. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, so if your head is 
telling you that a relationship is a bad idea, but your heart is telling like your heart is really attracted to it. Besides like deciding maybe to like not enter the relationship or to leave it if you're already in it, do you have any advice on how to bring your heart around? Yeah, I think um, so is it, we're talking about you're already in a relationship? Or is this you're wanting to get into one and you're trying to make the decision whether you pursue it or not? No, I mean I guess I'm thinking like you actually made the decision not to Right, so you're in a relationship, you know, a lot of people, um, so the question is, if you're in a relationship and you see some imbalances or there's some areas that you feel concerned about, what do you do about it? Um, I'll give you a quick example of how I'd answer that. Um, so my oldest daughter, when she was doing her PhD in counseling psych, she taught this on a college campus. So she, it was done in a seminar format, so it was done um, for about, uh, it was a three hour course, so she had maybe three weekends, but, um, and each day was like eight hours a day, so it was like a crash course. The first day she taught it, she came home, she was actually living at home, she was doing her PhD. The second day when she came home, she came to me, she goes, Dad, I gotta talk to you. I had four students, they were all females, they had to be females, but they all came to me at the beginning of class, the second class, and they said, we all had fights with our boyfriends last night, talking about this stuff with our boyfriends. <laughs> and they, my daughter said to them, well, you know, what are you talking about? What happened? They said, well, our relationships are like way out of balance from what this model described. And the model made sense to us. So we went home and we showed our boyfriends this model and they all got ticked off. Because we're like, we got to create a balance in there. Like, no, you're not going to create a balance here. We're staying in balance, and that's what we want. So they had all these fights, okay? My suggestion to my daughter and how she handles it with these students would be where I tell you to start. Um, I said, go back to the students and, and let them know what just happened. And tell them, do not act on what you are learning right away learn it well, and decide whether you really are convinced of it. If this is really um, how you want to build a relationship and it makes sense to you, and these are areas you want to explore, make sure you're convinced. Because haven't you ever known somebody that was starting to do something and they start, you know, they, they hear it, they get the idea, so they start real quick, but it's not something that they've really internalized. They haven't gotten all committed to it, and it starts to fall by the wayside. I, I see people breaking up that do that. They start to break up with somebody, and you're like, okay, you're going to break up with them. And then you see them the next day, and you're like, how did it go last night? Did you break up? No. We're going to try to work on it again. You're like, man, you were so convinced to break up. What, what happened? And they, they really weren't that convinced, so they kind of worked their way around. So the first thing I would tell you is, if you're in a relationship and you've got concerns, figure out, you know, if, if you can get the book, or you can learn this material, or you have other resources, Make sure you really learn it well before you start to address the issue. Because I think addressing the issues without having a deep root of what you believe in and what you think is going to be good and healthy for you is going to leave you kind of like, you know, yanked around. The second thing is I would tell you to use this model to help kind of de decipher where you are out of balance. You know, is, is it like here? There's a lot of relationships that the no is pretty high. They've got some concerns about what this person is really like, but they, they really spend all their time with them. They're heavily invested. Um, they're kind of, you know, caught up in, in that group. And, um, and maybe just in their own personal emotional needs. They, they like being in a relationship. I don't want to be out of a relationship. So they, they find themselves caught in this. Try to use this model to decide or decipher where your imbalance is and see if there's a way to pull it down um, or address it with a person. I think that um, this becomes a great tool to talk about what's going on in our relationship. Uh, if you're in a relationship with somebody and you read the book, ask them if they read it with you. You know, you read the book too. Talk about different chapters. Talk about you know how you're similar or how you're different. I, I think that. In dating relationships, many times, it's all black or white, all or nothing. And I think if you approach it 
by defining where we are, by learning a lot yourself, by trying to bring the other person on board, and being able to talk about it, you will be able to make decisions much more um, clearly and I think in a much more kind of like determined way as time goes on. All right? I know it's not a simple answer of just get out now or stay in it, but I would tell you if you get yourself a little more centered, I think that you'll feel better about how you handle the relationship. Yeah. Uh, so if you lop off like the fifth aspect touch, how do you think this applies to just French or to this model? Yeah. Um, I actually, I call it touch and not sex because um, physical touch it's coming. that is, quote, non-sexual is also very bonding. And we know that from all the different sciences as well, from social sciences to um, the biological sciences. Uh, we know it between um, a newborn and the mother. You know, hospital procedures change dramatically from major five-year, ten-year longitudinal studies between infants and then children and their mothers that immediately touch after childbirth compared to those that didn't. So touch as a physical interaction between humans generates connection. It's part of the overall relationship. So um, sexual is also another aspect to it. But I would say I wouldn't lock it off. I would include it in friendship. I'd say, there's touch and friends, between friends, you know. And, um, but this model applies the same in, in really all relationships. Uh, what I gave you as a principle, a guiding principle, says when you're building a new relationship, be careful of some of these levels going a lot higher than previous. I would say, listen, a lot of companies have learned this many, many years ago without my model. I mean, the 90-day probation period is a common procedure in new jobs. We are not going to give people responsibilities until our trust has time to build. And that won't happen until we give them enough time to really get to know their strengths and figure them out. So we need to, we need to not just hear them talk, we need to be together with them over time and see action. So those three T's are practiced in the corporate world in order to try to build these three areas before they really you know, get these full responsibilities. So if that makes sense to you, I would say, you know, that even in a marriage relationship, my wife and I are still managing these five areas. It's a different principle. In a long-term relationship, the principle isn't, no, let, don't let one level get higher than the previous. The principle in a long-term relationship is life's going to mess things up. You know, you're gonna, somebody's going to get sick, and something's going to happen to one of these levels. Your needs are going to change. You know, I work with the military tremendously. They go on a deployment, and they don't feel like they even know each other sometimes. You know, they lose touch. Trust is tested. They're very self-reliant during that year deployment, and none of, none of that's going on. And so life, there's all kinds of life deployments. So these bonds in this model apply to all relationships, and um, there's different principles that would kind of help you to understand how to apply it. One more question, or two more. Yeah. Go back to your uh, the end of courtship article. Yeah, well, not that article per se, but another article that was very popular, I think, last year, a few years ago. It was uh, How to Fall in Love with 23 Questions. I don't know if you read that one. How to Fall in Love what? With 23 Questions. With 23 Questions, okay. I don't know if you, love, if you read that one. If you, if you did, if you have any comments on it. I, I don't remember it. I think um, they've done a lot of studies on uh, initial chemistry uh, and how quickly people can determine chemistry. And um, they have it actually very quickly. Uh, but I, I would put a couple disclaimers. Um, number one, um, your chemistry, you know, initial chemistry can change. Uh, there are some really uh, huge studies that have been done, and quite a number of them, on arranged marriages where two people meet on their wedding day, and do they actually develop chemistry and fall in love? And, um, and then what produced that? So um, some of those studies, as well as other studies on uh, just more, you might say, in the Western culture of dating and chemistry, 
Um, we know that chemistry can develop between people. People can lose chemistry and get it back. Uh, there's a lot of um, books as well as studies done on uh, people in long-term relationships that have kind of fallen away from closeness and rekindled their relationship and rediscovered chemistry. So um, chemistry is not uh, a be-all, end-all that either happens or doesn't. It's not a black and white issue. And I would also say you can have really strong chemistry with somebody, and as you get to know them, lose that chemistry. I mean, some people that are initially attracted to you because you learn things about them and see qualities that you don't like, the very you know, presence of them can start turning you off. So chemistry can be lost as well as gained. So. Right. Thank you, Dr. Vanoff, so much for your time. Um,